Well, I'm very pleased to welcome everybody to our public lecture. We resumed our public lecture series after long break related to the COVID pandemic. And now we are gradually back to normal. And this is an important uh, landmark on, the, on this route to normal. So uh, the role of these public lectures is to provide uh, researchers uh, in our part of the world, in Kyrgyzstan, but also beyond, to... Ah, okay. Well, anyway, <laughs> well, some people may wish to see me. Yeah, good. Uh, so the role, the, the purpose of the lecture series is to provide updates on the most recent research and uh, fresh ideas which uh, people have. And uh, I'm very pleased to to present you the our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Azamat Timerkulov, who is currently uh, head of the Department for Analysis and Monitoring of Reforms in the administration of the President of the Kyrgyz Republic. So he combines his research with important government position. He received his PhD from Hamburg University in Germany and his master's degree from University Libre de Brussels. He is third class civil service advisor and what is most relevant to our today's uh, presentation, he is uh, author of the concept of natural development of the Kyrgyz Republic called Muras. And he also has uh, experience of working for, for the government in different positions and being a chairman of the Green Alliance uh, of Kyrgyzstan. So I think he is very well positioned to talk today about green economy model for the Kyrgyz Republic. Uh, just a couple of rules uh, of our uh, public lecture. There will be a lecture, some 30 minutes perhaps. And then after that, uh, we will have questions answers uh, session. Please uh, all turn your mobiles into silent mode, not, not to interrupt the discussion. And when you ask questions, please uh, present yourself. Just basically, we understand who is who is talking. Um, we have all together like one hour for, for everything, which I believe is a decent time for us to discuss this a very important topic. If everything is, seems to be clear, well, no, unfortunately, no translation today. Well, informally, we of course can help if somebody needs uh, any support. So, without further ado, let me provide the mic to my colleague. Please. Thank you very much. А, извиняюсь, э, аудио не идет от вас. Услатан, проверь. А так? О, да, о, сейчас, э, да, снова, заново, пожалуйста. Uh, from the beginning? Yes. Huh? Okay. So, uh, I'm not economist, I'm not ecologist, I'm political scientist, uh, with a focus on security issues and conflicts. Basically, um, my research were made on Fergana Valley, um, and, you know, I was always thinking what we should do in order to provide violent conflict uh, in southern part of Kyrgyzstan and basically in the Fergana Valley. Uh, so I used to work for different international organizations as a consultant, and I also uh, worked for the Security Council of the Kyrgyz Republic as an uh, analyst. And while working at the Security Council, uh, I was always thinking, how can we prevent violent conflict in Fergana Valley. And I came to the idea that, in fact, what we are doing, international organizations, NGOs, uh, states, uh, in, in order to prevent uh, open conflict in Fergana Valley, this is all very, very uh, on the surface. 
Yeah, this is not very something uh, very, uh, which goes deep into the roots of the conflict. So I started to think, uh, what is the root co cause of the conflict? And in fact, the root cause of the conflict uh, that can be a violent conflict, uh, the root cause is in fact the level of water. So if the level of water in the rivers will fall down as it is falling down today, then the risks of the violent conflict will increase. Yeah? So this is the root causes of the situation. So I started to think, what should we do in order to avoid the decreasing of the level of water in the rivers, or at least if we cannot stop it, at least to slow down this process. Yeah. So I started to uh, read about this and I came to the glaciers. I started to learn what's going on with glaciers. And then I found out that our glaciers are melting. The glaciers of the Kyrgyz Republic are melting. Uh, during the last 50 years, we lost up to 20, 30% of our glaciers. It depends on uh, different sources. Different sources give different um, uh, data. So this map that you can see here is the glaciers that we are risking to lose by the end of this century. Up to 80% of our glaciers we risk to lose because of the global warming, because of the climate change. Um, so if it happens, then nobody will think, as you understand, nobody will think about economy, about politics. We, we simply risk to uh, fall down to the violent conflict uh, in the region. Yeah? So the, the, the risk is very high. Of course, this is the worst case scenario. Yeah? The, this is not uh, the status quo scenario, but this is the worst case case scenario. So then I started to think uh, what's going on with our glaciers? Why they are melting? Yeah? And is it possible to slow down the melting of glaciers? Of course, it's not possible to stop it 100%, but at least what can we do to slow down? So that's how I became, uh, if you want, you know, on the track of uh, ecology rather than uh, security and conflict. Uh, so I started to read about glaciers and uh, factors that influence glaciers. And then I found out that in fact, the only, almost only factor that is the basic regulator of the climate, it is a forest. It is a forest. The forest, in, in fact, it is a pump. It is a pumping machine. Forest is pumping the humidity under the ground and then uh, give this humidity to the atmosphere and this humidity in the form of rain and snow, it falls down. And if, it, if the forest is in the mountains, then the, this rain and uh, snow falls down on the mountains. Yeah? And thus, forest can slow down the melting of glaciers. Yeah? So this is almost the only one factor. We have, Kyrgyz Republic has five and half percent of um, territory forest. Yeah? Th that's not enough. But the problem is that our forest is squeezing. The size of forest is squeezing. What is the problem? So then I started to read about forest and uh, you know, I was interested in why the forest is squeezing, what's going on today with the forest. And in fact, uh, the 
biggest problem is our economy, the economy of the Kyrgyz Republic. <laughs> What's wrong with our economy? The problem is that we have almost only one economic activity spread on the 95% of our territories. Almost only one economic activity. And this is cattle breeding. Well, we have some minings in the mountains, but in general, 95% of our territories, which are mountains, are used by cattle breeding. But the problem is that our cattle is not of a good quality, very bad quality. Uh, the number of the heads has been increased after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the quality has been decreased. For example, one cow in Kyrgyzstan gives uh, two tons of milk per year. In Israel, one cow gives 12 tons of milk per year. In Holland, if cows give less than eight tons, they consider it as a useless. And they, you know, slaughtered it to the meat. But we, we have cows which gives two tons per year. What about sheep? The situation is the same. Our sheep gives the wool, which, you know what we do with the wool? We burn it. We burn it because the quality is very low. If before we had such uh, like, you know, Merinos, uh, uh, Merinos, very high quality uh, ship. And wool was used for uh, textile. Today it doesn't work. We don't have Merinos anymore. Tankarunne uh, Avtsa in Russian. So Tankarunne Avtsa almost doesn't exist in Kyrgyzstan today. So for this bad quality cattle, we gave the best pastures in this region. The best pastures of this region. And when we pasture it, we do not keep any norms, any principles of pasturing. Normally, it should be, uh, you know, for one hectare, some limited number of cattle could be pastured. We do not keep these norms. We, uh, pas we are pasturing as many uh, cattle as we have. Also, there should be some rotation principles. For example, one year we use one pasture, um, another pasture is having a rest, and the second year we switch them, and thus pasture have a time to recover. Today we do not practice such uh, rotation principles. We have simply chaotic pasturing in the mountains. So because of this chaotic pasturing, uh, the result of this chaotic pasturing is that today up to 70% of our pastures have been degraded. The quality of grass is not good anymore. So it's not uh, enough for animals, this grass that we have today in our pastures. So what's going on? This cattle is going up to the mountains and they penetrate to the ecosystems, they penetrate to the forest, and in the forest they eat grass, and together with grass they eat young trees. And they not only eat these young trees, but they step down on these trees, and thus this cattle is killing. They have already killed 
our pastures and now they are killing our forest, our ecosystems. And as I said, forest is the only uh, regulator of the climate. Forest is not only, uh, it is not only plants, it's not only trees, forest is, forest is, it is also um, biodiversity. And forest is the only factor that can slow down the melting of glaciers. It is the only one factor. But today we destroy this factor, yeah? So then the point is that if we continue to practice such chaotic cattle breeding and such uh, economic activity, then we will destroy everything. And we, uh, we risk simply uh, to increase further the melting of glaciers, which can lead us to violent conflict uh, with our neighbors. So this is very, primordial, that's very crucial to change the situation. So the question is now, how can we change the situation? I believe that there is a solution and um, many experts uh, also think that we can change the situation. Um, with this model, I was, you know, uh, trying to uh, find supporters, experts who can help to create this model uh, already for five years. Yeah? So for starting from 2016, I was trying to uh, create this model that I will present you now. Uh, so many different experts from different spheres of ecologists, economists, uh, they gave their inputs to create this model. So um, if you want, this model is not only about ecology, it is about economy, but also it is about security because it can prevent, um, we believe it can prevent violent conflict. So what is this model? First of all, we have to do something, of course, with the cattle breeding. We have to make some order in the cattle breeding. What can we do? We can pass to farming like it was during the Soviet time when we had big farms in the uh, Kalhoz and Safhoz. Uh, we also have this system in Australia, in Western Europe, when we keep cattle in the farms. Yeah, so we have to keep our animals in the farms and we have to practice some rotating pastures and also keeping some norms, not more than some uh, limit of uh, cattle on one hectare. Yeah? So when we keep, uh, when we put an order in the cattle breeding, then we should give to our farmers alternative income that they practice not only cattle breeding. What can be this alternative economic activity? This is fish industry. We have so many waters, best waters, the quality of our water. And we have many rivers, so we can use all these resources for fish industry. We are already on this way. We are already developing our fish industry. In fact, our, our business is much uh, faster than the state and business already is developing fish industry. So this activity can be some additional um, economic activity for our farmers. Moreover, when we create this alternative activity, when we put some order in the cattle breeding, 
we can free degraded pastures. We have almost 5 million hectares of degraded pastures. So we can use all these lands for developing of horticulture and agroforestry. We can plant there apples, apricots, list can be very long. And these all will be ecologically clear products because our mountainous areas never seen any pesticide chemistry. The land is pure, the water is also poor, and the air is in the mountains is also poor. Moreover, the climate in the mountains is different than the climate in the plain area. So if we plant the same uh, sort of tree, let's say apple in the plain of Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan and in the mountains of Kyrgyzstan, the quality of the fruit will be completely different. Uh, the fruit of the mountains of Kyrgyzstan will be better quality in the, for, in the um, uh, sense of taste. Why? Because in the mountains during the day is very hot. And during by night, the temperature goes down. It's very cold. So this a very fast change of temperature creates more um, yeah? So all these uh, juices of the fruit, they uh, start to move faster. And fruits are more um, juicy. So we are out of the concurrence here. We can export it. We can export it to China, to Pakistan, to India, to Russia, etc. So this is a very good activity because it can bring uh, a lot of economic benefit to Kyrgyzstan, but also these are also trees. They will not destroy nature, but on the contrary, they will uh, bring some benefit to the nature. Because again, it is a tree and they will not only clear the air, but they can also um, be a positive factor for the regeneration of the pasture to the regeneration of the quality of the grass on, on this area. Also agroforestry, horticulture, we can practice up to 2000 meters above the sea level and uh, above 2000 meters above the sea level up to 3000 meters, we can practice uh, agroforestry, which is absolutely new for Kyrgyzstan uh, activity. And I know that your university is very interested in this um, economic activity. Uh, and there are a lot of research on this issue. In the future, it will be developed because we are interested in this. Again, it is beneficial for the economy because it can give not only wood, but it can give mushrooms, honey, um, herbs, medical herbs, and many, many other uh, resources for economy. But also, this again, it is trees, it's a forest, even if it is a artificial forest, yeah, planted forest. Nevertheless, these are trees. They will also uh, be a positive factor for the uh, slowing down uh, of melting of glaciers. But this is not the end of the possibilities of the Kyrgyz Republic. We have a lot of resources in the mountains, which can be very beneficial for human health. We have mineral waters, radon waters, we have uh, salt caves, we have medical herbs, 
I'm not speaking about the clean air, clean water, and clean products. Yeah. So all these resources we will use for creation of medical tourism in the Kyrgyz Republic. So I will, before I was saying, we can do this. Today, I'm, I will say we will do this because this is already national program of the Kyrgyz Republic for the next five years. So we will develop medical tourism. We will create healing tourism, different medical centers, sanatoriums, kurorty, zdravnice, lichebnice, etc. Yeah, we already have this, but it is not developed. We should develop it. After this pandemic of coronavirus, human being, the whole humanity, understood that the most important and the most precious resource, it's not gold, it's not oil, it's not gas. The oil pressures, it's resources, natural resources, which can be beneficial for your health. So everything now is coming to the order, to the right order. Yeah. So if in the 20th century, the rich country was a country which had oil, gas, or gold, in the 21st century, the rich country will be the country which has clear air, clear water, clear land. And this country is Kyrgyzstan. We are the rich country. We will not become the rich country. Today, already, we are the richest country in this region. So, we believe that after this pandemia, when everything will stabilize, more and more tourists from different parts of the world will come to Kyrgyzstan to get some healings, to get some medical treatment, natural medical treatment. Yeah? So this will, um, all this will need some energy. Yeah? We have possibility to create the renewable energy sources in the mountains. Uh, during Soviet time, we had 151 small uh, hydroelectricity stations. Today, only 13 of them are still working. So we can restart all these more than 100 uh, small uh, hydroelectricity plants. Moreover, we have possibility not only for hydroelectricity, we have possibility uh, for uh, wind electricity. And already uh, different companies of the world, big companies, they are interested in uh, starting this business in the Kyrgyz Republic. So all this model, all these economic activities, we believe that they can be kind of a locomotive for the whole economy of the Kyrgyz Republic. And in a multiplication effect, they can promote development of other economic sectors, such as construction, uh, trade, service, etc. So this is on its own a model, economic model, which can bring benefit for and development for the country. But this model can solve not only economic problems of the Kyrgyz Republic, this model can solve social problems of the country. We have more than 1 million our citizens are working in Russian Federation in Kazakhstan. So we can create jobs for these people in their homeland, in their mountains, where they were born, when they grew up, 
and we can bring them back home to make a clean job, clean in both sense of this word, clean in terms of air, water, and land, and clean in terms of moral activity. Yeah? So thus we can solve this problem of external and internal migration. But moreover, this model can solve other problems of the Kyrgyz Republic. Landslide, landslide, yeah? right? Uh, landslide, um, как это, палатки, оползни, да? It can, in general, improve the ecological environment of the Kyrgyz Republic. It can increase biodiversity and it can slow down the melting of glaciers because such number of trees in the mountains the increasing of the territory of the forest, they will be uh, very, very beneficial for the glaciers. And they will, if not stop the melting of glaciers, they will slow down this process because again, forest is a pump forest with its root. The trees are, are pumping humidity from the land uh, underground and then they give this humidity to the air, to the atmosphere, and this humidity in the form of rain and snow, um, they uh, sorry, <laughs> For, thank you. They fall down on the glaciers, and thus the process of uh, melting of glaciers can slow down. But also, forest is decreasing the temperature from the global warming. Because for example, when in hot summer, you are uh, passing by uh, of uh, the park, park, you can feel this uh, fresh air from the trees, fresh air from the parks. So the same principle, forest can slow down the, down the temperature in the mountains and thus they can cool down um, the glaciers. So that's how, um, political scientists uh, made a very long circle from conflict to ecology to economy. And I came back to the security, to the conflict, uh, because all this is a one complex system. We cannot talk about the security without taking into consideration ecology. We cannot think about the security without taking into account uh, melting of glaciers, uh, forests, uh, economy. All this is interdependent and all this is a one big uh, complex. Thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I will be ready to answer. Many, many thanks, uh, Dr. Tmerkov. Very, very interesting for, for me and probably for others. So while well, the floor is open for questions, uh, if you ask, when, when you ask questions, please uh, just uh, present yourself and ask your question. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, Elira Trudubayeva. I teach here as a visiting scholar at media department at UCA. Um, my question regarding nut trees in Jalalabad. Uh, this not forests. Uh, uh, there are also local people like Kukjangak and others. They are also breeding cattle inside nut trees. I mean, inside the forest. So uh, honey and uh, others, but also breeding cattle. So um, are there any measures taken to protect these nut forests in Jalalabad? Very good question, because uh, this example of not forest, this is, you know, like a model example of this problem. Uh, we have the biggest not forest in the world, the biggest and the oldest not forest in the world. And today we are losing this oldest forest in the world. We are losing. Why? Because 
this forest was given for the rent to the local people. And each family has, one family has two hectares, another family might have uh, 10 hectares. So they use it for nuts, they collect nuts. When nuts fall down from the trees on the ground, they collect all these nuts, they sell it. Uh, nuts uh, in the uh, markets of, the, of Bishkek, these are nuts collected by these people. And then some nuts, they naturally, they, they, they are not um, uh, recognized. Yeah? They are on the ground and they start to become a tree. They grew up. Yeah? So when these nuts, which were not collected by the people, uh, are getting to become a tree, now they turn for cattle. Cattle is entering the forest. Cattle is eating these young trees. Cattle is stepping down on these young trees. And today in this nut forest, there are almost no young trees. So when these old trees will die, there is no young trees to replace them. So this is a huge problem uh, for our country. So what to do? That's a very good question. Of course, first of all, we have to, to do, do something with the cattle breeding. Uh, but we have to give to the, to the people alternative income. And uh, this alternative income uh, should replace them, this activity that they practice today. Yeah. So uh, also we have give them alternative um, forest, um, al uh, alternative plants of trees, because th that's what we, we are talking. It, it's, um, that's what they practice during summer. But during winter, they cut these trees for the heating because it's cold. Yeah. So on one hand, we have to give them alternative income. On the other hand, we have to give them alternative heating. That's a huge problem. Um, and this is not relevant for only for uh, Arslan Bob. This is relevant for the whole Kyrgyz Republic, for other uh, mountainous territories as well. So that's why today um, this model uh, was put on the paper. Uh, our cabinet of ministry adopted a plan uh, for the next five years. Uh, this plan consists of 853 activities, and some activities are focused on this problem uh, that we are talking. Yeah. Of course, it's for the moment it's only on the paper, but I hope we will manage to uh, implement it. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Temurkul, for your nice presentation. Uh, my name is Ilgis Kambarov. Uh, I work at the Kyrgyz Economic University. And uh, my question, or I would like to hear your op opinion, and uh, I would like to express my understanding, modest understanding, of, the, uh, of what you have mentioned uh, regarding uh, the water, the level of water. As far as I know, uh, Kyrgyz Republic uh, sells uh, water to Kazakhstan in return for electricity. We give them water, they sell us electricity when we need it. It seems to me that Kyrgyz are politically dependent uh, on the bigger uh, economically and more powerful countries. For example, in this particular case, Kazakhstan. So, uh, and if I understand correctly, it impacts on the level of uh, water, which you suggest to use as a fisher as an alternative economic activity during the pastures having rest from uh, cattle breeding. That's the, um, and uh, how politically would be possible if this request or this relationship with neighbor and bigger country is not easy, in other words, you know, it is sensitive. If we don't give them the water, there is a risk that uh, we may have, um, 
you know, uh, not not very good implications beginning from blocking our tracks on the border and not selling or, or highly expensive electricity. And these are very, a couple of examples which can significantly impact on the social economic situations on the society right on the spot. So, uh, and um, the other side of uh, uh, the question is the uh, quality of the cattle that you mentioned. Uh, two tons versus 12 tons of milk per year, from an example of Israel that you mentioned. It's very interesting, I didn't know that. But if I understand correctly, if we want to improve the quality of the cattle to increase their number, don't they need more grass uh, to consume in order to be more uh, you know, productive, uh, to produce more milk? And it, it seems to me, I'm not the uh, specialist in this field, but I would like to hear your opinion. Uh, how do you see uh, the way out of this, in my view, very complex and complicated situation? So, and we have, of course, a lobby of the agricultural sector. We have farmers who basically do uh, living for this and fishery not very developed in a way. They're not ready to, to go for it for really fast because again interconnection with the level of water which we sell to Kazakhstan so uh, I would like to hear your opinion thank you very much thank you uh, re regarding your first question <clears throat> you know Kyrgyz Republic has basically four economic partners the first is Russia uh, our trade is something about two and a half million dollars the second is China something about one and a half millions uh, this is according to our statistic. According to Chinese statistic, it's something about six or seven milliards. Uh, the third is Kazakhstan. Uh, the fourth is Uzbekistan. But if we look to the partners of Kazakhstan, uh, Kyrgyz Republic is on the 22nd place. We are not even in the ten, first 10, not even first 20s. The first economic partner of Kazakhstan, it's Russia, $25 million of trade between them. Uh, the second, China, and then all European countries, including United States. So Kazakhstan, economically, he is not part of this region. He is a part of uh, Europe. He is a part maybe of uh, um, North America, but Basically, he is not trading with Central Asian countries. He is not dependent on us at all. So that's why they can, you know, impose their will on us, because for us, Kazakhstan is the third economic partner. But for them, we are, you know, somewhere at the end of the list. Of course, we cannot. Um, we cannot uh, block the water. We will give to Kazakhstan the water. There is no way. And a fish industry doesn't mean that we sh will not give the water to Kazakhstan. Uh, because fish industry, uh, it means that this water is not blocked. The water will should run. Uh, there is a special uh, reservoirs and the water goes through these reservoirs, but it uh, it's not blocked. Yeah, it flows down according to its natural uh, path. So there is no any problem. Um, re regarding your second question uh, on the quality of cattle, uh, normally if you, uh, well, I'm also not a specialist of this area, but as I told you, I collected uh, different information from experts, uh, and thus this model uh, was completed. Yeah. So, um, according to the experts of this area, uh, if you take such developed countries as Australia or even closer to us, Belarus, which also have uh, has developed cattle breeding. Um, sector, they practice farming, but they give um, food to animals in the farms. Animals are not going 
somewhere on the pastures, стойловый откорм. То есть они где стоят, animals where they stay in the farm, and they eat uh, food in the farm. Yeah? Not grass, not grass, but different sort of uh, food. So we can use this practice and we can use pasturing for some short period. Yeah? So that's the way how uh, European countries practice cattle breeding. Uh, and uh, we don't need for this more grass. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Just we have, a, apart from people in this room, we also have quite a few people online. I would like to offer them opportunity also to ask questions. I think there are a couple of people and uh, my colleague will read out those. So the first question comes from Azad Mukhalif. Any idea how are you planning to implement the cattle breeding rotating pastures? Have you experienced of carbon offset projects, any projects in Kyrgyzstan? Also good questions. Um, to implement cattle breeding rotating pastures, it's, it's not a problem. Um, during Soviet time, we practiced um, rotating principle. Uh, carbon projects, this is something new for us. Um, and thank you for asking me this question because um, carbon market is also a part of this model. Kyrgyzstan has a big potential to be a player on the carbon market. New, new coming, new developing carbon market, global carbon market. Yeah. Carbon market means that uh, for just as a glam, simple example, uh, we have big factories which make a harm on the environment. Yeah? And these factories, they pay higher taxes in their homeland. And if they want to decrease the harm on the environment, they have to plant trees and not necessarily on their own uh, country. They can plant it somewhere uh, in the world. So that can be Kyrgyzstan. We have 7 million hectares of free territories where we can plant trees. 7 million. We have 942 hectares of nursery, uh, pitomniki, nursery where we can grow trees. But today we use only 140 hectares out of these 942 hectares. So 800 hectares are simply, you know, here without being used. We have potential. We have potential to grow trees. We have potential to plant trees. And these trees we can sell not trees we can sell, but their function. Because each tree, they um, uh, repro they are reprocessing carbon. And this function can be sell on this new uh, international carbon market. So this is also our goal. Now we are in the uh, present administration and uh, together with the ministry of environment, we are working on this direction and um, different international organizations are helping us with uh, expert knowledge. And hopefully in the future, we will be uh, a player on this international carbon market. So we're trying, we're trying this direction. Thank you for this question. Um, should we have another floor from online or? Uh, then. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Timarkola, for the inciting ideas. Uh, and uh, I'm really appreciative of uh, you integrating uh, the ecology and economy and security, uh, which is, I think, uh, the right approach. 
and uh, this is uh, what the whole world should go for. Uh, but I'd like to make a, a few remarks, basically three remarks very quickly. Uh, first is uh, on the glaciers and the climate. Um, the ecology basically tells us that the greenhouse gases, they mix very evenly in the atmosphere, especially carbon dioxide, which means that no matter where you are polluting or emitting carbon dioxide, it's going to be evenly distributed around the world. So by focusing only in uh, Kyrgyzstan in the forestry, I'm afraid we won't be able to solve the melting of the glaciers. We will do a little bit, but uh, I don't think this is going to be a major breakthrough. So uh, just moderating our expectation on the glaciers. The second is on energy. Um, you're right that Kyrgyzstan is an upstream and there is a lot of water. And previously, there were many small scale hydropower plants that the functions. Uh, we have done some uh, research on the renewable energy potential as well as deployment. The paper is available in English and soon there will be a Russian translation also available of this review that includes Kyrgyzstan among other Central Asian countries. Basically what we found is that the major reason why these small hydropower plants don't work is because there's basically no water in the winter. That's as simple as that. Technically they operate in the summertime, but there's no water in the wintertime. And then as a result, it becomes very expensive to build these kinds of uh, hydropower stations. In terms of the wind, uh, of course, this has a lot of potential, but then the terrain is mountainous. You can imagine the, just the, the blade of a, a medium-sized uh, wind power plant is as long as 30 to 80 meters in where you can find roads to transport that equipment. So I uh, need to be moderating our expectation on the energy front as well. And finally, probably the biggest is the governance. The governance is the biggest part. Uh, our colleague Andre Dora has done a lot of research on the pasture um, in the livestock and especially the role of the pasture committees and how challenging it has been. But also the governance relates to other aspects of the economy, basically, how are we handling the money? And all of you know very well from the experience of the winters where the Bishkek power plant failed. And so before talking about the grand visions and uh, offering some kind of technical solutions with uh, more pastures and you know, more efficient livestock and some forests, we need to solve the governance problem as well. So these are remarks, uh, not uh, really asking a question, but trying to moderate our expectations about what can actually be feasibly achieved. Uh, but nonetheless, thanks very much for the vision. Thank you. Uh, yes, you, you, you're absolutely right. Uh, for the moment, we even uh, don't have scientific provements that forest can slow down the melting of glaciers. This is just an expectation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was on the conference of uh, uh, glaciologists in Bhutan in 2018. And in this conf international conference, there, there were a lot of glaciologists from uh, a lot all over the world. And I made this presentation to these glaciologists, and they told me to our delegation from Kyrgyzstan, they told us that. There is no any scientific research made on the impact on for or forest on the uh, melting of glaciers. But they agree that it's obvious that forest can slow down the melting of glaciers, but again, it's not scientifically proved yet. Now in Kyrgyzstan, uh, there is a big um, scientific research project is going on uh, by the um, National Academy. There is a Tianshansky uh, Center Исследования Водных Проблем together with China, France, and I think Belgium, if I'm not wrong. They are making this research and they are monitoring how the forest uh, 
is impacting on the melting of glaciers. They choose uh, one glacier and they are planting trees on one side of the glacier and they're not planting trees on the other side of the glaciers and they want to see how this difference um, can impact on the uh, melting of glaciers. But of course, the results of this scientific research uh, will be uh, um, made after several years. So you're absolutely right. Uh, we cannot be sure, but it is the only, to, for today, it is the only way uh, which is obvious and we should use any possibility that we have because glaciologists tried many different ways to save glaciers. Uh, they tried to invent some fantastic solutions. Uh, none of them worked, but this very simple solution seems to be uh, at least somehow effective. Yeah. So we should try it, we should try. Uh, re regarding the problem of the uh, small hydroelectric plant, again, you, you are right. This is another problem. Uh, the level of uh, the water in the rivers is going down. And because of this, these uh, hydroelectric stations can be not effective. That's true, uh, but today, we have many different types of these hydroelectricity stations. It is not only one type that it was during the Soviet time. Today we have very, very small uh, hydroelectricity engines. And, you know, we can use it uh, almost in the very, very small river. So for this problem, we also uh, can find the solution. Uh, regarding the wind uh, plants, today we have something about 100 um, wind, uh, 100 areas, 100 spots where these wind electricity stations can be uh, built. So the Ministry of Energy uh, made this list and now they are working with investors Today, um, from France, we have very serious investor which is interested in uh, building a um, wind station in Kyrgyzstan. They have already built wind station in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and now uh, they want to build this station in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we have two more um, foreign uh, companies which are interested, and um, so uh, this is uh, this is work which is going on. Yeah, I hope that uh, this year we will already start to plant uh, to to build uh, wind stations at least three. But as I told you, in the list we have one hundred. Uh, technical details, sorry, I uh, cannot um, answer you. But uh, you can, if you are interested, you can. Um, addressed to the Minister of Energy, and they uh, will give you this list with all details. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, Bogdan, do you have a question or? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, I really enjoyed the lecture. I think it's wonderful to hear a political scientist uh, that presents a bigger picture because so much of this discussion gets technical on one, uh, one or two issues. Uh, so I congratulate you on trying to aggregate a lot of in, uh, information into a sort of comprehensive, uh, a, a comprehensive picture. And of course, um, we can have a lot, <laughs> there, there undoubtedly will be very many, dis much discussion about uh, the various aspects of it. But one of the, uh, the issues, you know, if you could please think about it, is that th this kind of program that involves 800 components has to be disaggregated, prioritized, and properly administered. And the Kyrgyzstan public administration is not exactly the strong suit of the country. 
So what are the administrative challenges and what kind of changes do you see uh, that are required in order to increase government efficiency to be able to handle incrementally uh, this ambitious program? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, very important question, of course, uh, in order to realize this, uh, we need a very effective system. So today, this model, as I told you, it, it's, um, it, it was uh, put it on the paper, uh, but uh, we have to um, make it in the real life. And it's much more difficult than to put it on the paper. Uh, I agree with you that uh, our governance today has a lot of problems uh, and uh, it will be not easy to uh, realize this model in the real life with such uh, a system uh, as we have today. Uh, but um, I think that uh, we at least we have to start. At least we have to move in this direction. Uh, and we have already started. We moved in this direction. Uh, so I hope that in the future, the state administrative system will improve. Um, if I look back to the situation, our country didn't have any clear vision where to go and what model, model to create. Yeah? Uh, we were, you know, like a ship which was flowing somewhere without knowing where to flow. But today we already have this vision and the uh, leadership of our country um, also, they share this view that we are talking today. And this is already a big progress, I think. This is already something that we achieved. Uh, the leadership is supporting this model. They give us a green light. They said that this is the right uh, way that Kyrgyzstan should develop. And the leadership of the country, I mean, the president of the Kyrgyz Republic, Sadr Japarov, and uh, the prime minister, Akhilbek Japarov, both they support these ideas and they try to help us. Uh, they try to help what in their hands, what they can do in order to uh, realize this model in real life. Uh, so I think that this is already uh, an achievement. So hopefully maybe in the future, we will manage to form uh, not only political will, but also effective political institutions which will uh, realize this model. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at six uh, o'clock already. Do you have some additional time to take one or two additional yes, questions? Yes. Oh, great. So uh, some people in the room still would like to ask questions. Uh, anybody? Uh, except new people, well, no, <laughs> just well before offer a second opportunity just to, to be sure that the, everybody used that. Okay, then well, probably the last question. Thank you. Um, as this uh, problem is a Central Asian problem, water, water shortage, glaciers, are there any Central Asian initiatives or integration? like a vision together to collaborate to solve this problem. Uh, the second is about Green Deal of the European Union. Are there any collaborations with this Green Deal program of EU? Uh, and regarding solar panels, like I know that there is a factory of solar panels in Kyrgyzstan. And like, are there any initiatives to build solar, to use it as an alternative energy source? Mm, and one more story for these wind uh, state, uh, wind towers. That uh, are there uh, any clear uh, requirements like to uh, who are building this France from France investors to uh, to follow standards such as not uh, not damaging environment, not damaging biodiversity in these one hundred spots. 
uh, well, you, you, you're right that uh, the problem of the glaciers, this is not only the problem of the Kyrgyz Republic, this is a problem of neighboring countries as well. And they should understand it. They should understand that their uh, economy, their health, uh, their security depends on the glaciers in our mountains. And they should at least uh, help us to solve these problems. Uh, they claim that they understand it. They claim that they support us. But um, personally, I don't see any real help in terms of financial resources, uh, technical assistance um, from neighboring countries. Uh, but international community, that's a completely different story. Uh, international community, I mean, international organizations like UN, World Bank, uh, Asian Development Bank, uh, Green Climate Fund, they understand the importance of glaciers of the Kyrgyz Republic, not only for Kyrgyzstan, not only for Central Asian region, but for the environment of the planet in general, because countries, mountainous countries with glaciers like Kyrgyzstan, they're not so many. Uh, so they're ready to help us. They're ready to help us with financial resources. They're already helping us. They're already helping us with finance, with expertise. Um, and in the future, they are ready to help us even more. For example, Green Climate Fund, uh, they have per year $1 million dollars that are given to the countries that want to plant trees on their territories. And this money are given in the form of uh, grants, not credits. So now we are um, planning to uh, cooperate with Green Climate Fund uh, in order to get access to this money. For example, our neighbors, they already received millions of dollars from this uh, Green Climate Fund. Kyrgyzstan received not more than, I, I think, $50 million. It's very small. Uh, so in the future, we have plans to cooperate with them more. And I hope that uh, this help will be very, um, you know, uh, uh, but it depends on us. It depends on us uh, if our project proposals will be of high quality, if these international organizations, if Green Climate Fund will believe that we are able to do this, that we are able to implement this model, they will help us and they are ready to help us. We talked with them, we made different um, meetings and they are ready to provide uh, necessary funds to realize this model, but they also have to believe that we are able to do this. Yeah, so it depends on us. And uh, sorry, what was your next question? Solar plants. Uh, solar plants. Yes, uh, we have a factory in Kyrgyzstan which produce uh, solar plants. Um, this year, we are going to start to build three new solar stations in Kyrgyzstan. And today, this morning, um, Prime Minister Nakhulbek Japarov uh, announced it. He said uh, in the uh, meeting of the Cabinet of Ministers, he said that uh, this year Kyrgyzstan will start to build three solar stations and one wind station. So uh, hopefully this year we'll start to do this. Okay, uh, I think it was a very, very interesting discussion about so for me, it's kind of pretty clear that that's the start of the discussion and more kind of uh, high level, but also detailed and technical level discussion. Uh, research is needed to implement that, but I think it is very important that our country embarked on that green development uh, uh, 
pass already in a very practical way, right? So with that, uh, I would like to conclude this uh, meeting and thank very much our speaker for very interesting presentation. We thank generated you. so many questions. And we very much hope you will come again with new uh, information on new developments. Uh, with much pleasure. Some, uh, some, in some future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.